Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome um, to our strategy discussion this afternoon. Uh, my name is Rosie Bennyworth. I'm the Chief Inspector of Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care at the CQC. Um, and this afternoon we'll be talking about how uh, we work to meet people's needs. Um, I'm a GP by background and I've been with the CQC for about 18 months and um, I'm, I'm really delighted that we're going to be having this conversation. So if we could go to the next slide please Steph. So we've got a little webinar team here today um, and I'm supported by Jill, Ronald, um, Jennifer, Sam and Stephanie and they are here to help as well and they will be helping with the questions and things as we go along. So if we go um, if we go on to the next slide, I just want to talk about what we're going to cover today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, as you can see, about our purpose and vision, um, what we've learned from COVID-19, how we're looking to change um, our timeline. Uh, one of our emerging strategic themes, which is on meeting people's needs, um, we're going to have plenty of time for questions today and we really want to hear your questions. We want you to find this a really useful, uh, productive um, meeting. So, so please bear with us. We know that this isn't as ideal as having face to face meetings and that sometimes technology can cause all sorts of problems. So bear with us um, and uh, we will do our best to, to make sure that it's as smooth as possible. Um, and we'll also do our best to make sure that we stick to the time allocated. So the way that this uh, webinar is set up for those of you who are not familiar with um, Teams Live is that I'm uh, myself and the team are able to speak, but um, unfortunately we're unable to hear your voices. But we do want to hear all your comments, all your thoughts, all your questions. And you can use the chat function at the side um, side of the screen to ask any questions. If you do put something, it would be really helpful to have your name um, and uh, uh, post your name so that we can get back to you if we don't have a chance to answer all of the questions uh, today. Um, and also, um, you may have questions that are not related to the strategy. So please do post these. Um, please do um, put them up because we want to hear from you um, and we will get back to you by email after the event. Um, just one final thing to mention is that this is recorded um, just so that we can use it, uh, use it again and for people to have access to it again. So uh, just so you're aware of that. So if we could go on to the next slide, um, please, Steph. So I just wanted to uh, remind everyone on the call, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but I just wanted to talk about what our purpose is and what our vision is as a regulator. And our purpose um, is that we make sure that health and social care services provide people with safe, effective, compassionate, high quality care, and that we encourage services to improve. Our purpose is not changed and, um, and is more important than ever at the moment. Um, and uh, we're really keen to re uh, reestablish our purpose and to make sure that uh, we absolutely um, deliver on our purpose as an organisation. Our vision is uh, that we want to become a world class regulator. We want to drive improvements in how people experience health and care services, working towards a safer future. Um, and I think from all aspects of the care that we, we regulate, and we regulate a very wide uh, selection of, of providers, including um, hospitals, care homes, uh, domiciliary care, online providers, primary care providers, um, we see that the importance of what we do and why we do it is more visible than ever. And we want to regulate in a way um, that is simple, that's based on open, strong relationships with providers and um, to be more effective uh, by focusing our actions on the areas where we can have the biggest impact on people's care. So I think we've all learned a huge amount over the last few weeks and months um, and the COVID pandemic for us has really amplified what we knew that we've got to learn how to work in new ways um, to keep people safe and to in ensure that world class regulation um, is ahead of all of the challenges uh, that we face. And we recognise that the only way we're going to do that is to change and to transform how we work. So um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. 
Okay. So we know that um, we know that things are changing rapidly, and they've probably changed more rapidly in the last three or four months than they have done uh, in the last three or four years in many ways. And uh, we've known for a long time that uh, people um, are getting older. We've got uh, changing demographics. We've got a lot more people with long term conditions. We know that resources are limited. We know that um, there's new technologies, new ways of working. And actually in, in the sectors I regulate, so for general practice, for example, we've seen massive transformation in the last uh, three or four months in terms of how people are providing care with digital solutions. And uh, that's only going to grow and change. And um, so we're, we are expecting continuing rapid change and we know that um, we need to be flexible and responsive in order to be able to deal with that. We also know we don't always get it right. Um, we need to judge our own successes by those who we regulate. And if people aren't improving um, and if the health and social care system is not providing people with uh, consistently high quality care, we need to look at ourselves and think, actually, how do we improve in order to help providers improve? What can we do as a regulator that's going to make things better? We think a smarter way of regulating uh, will help us identify more quickly and consistently where to target our work and when to act to keep people safe. Um, I think it's also important that we continue to challenge ourselves as to how we streamline um, the requirements we make of providers. We've got to be more relevant and responsive. We need to match the pace of things that are changing in the outside world. We need to get ahead of those. And there's lots of innovations where we constantly see emerge and we need to think carefully about how do we enable those innovations um, as a regulator, but make sure that they're there in a safe way. Um, we know that things, uh, particularly after COVID, are going to look very different um, and we've got to adapt to that as well. At the moment, we don't have a full picture of care quality across an area, system or pathway, and we want to uh, assess that. We know that actually for a person using services, their journey doesn't involve just one provider usually. Usually they, they have uh, care that involves primary care, social care, um, hospital care, a whole range of different providers that need to work together to really deliver that person-centred care. And often the quality of care goes beyond what one provider can deliver. And it's very dependent on how those providers work together. And we need to make sure that our teams are equipped with the right tools, the right capabilities to be able to deliver our strategy and that we've got the right technology, the right systems, the right culture um, to be able to um, place us in a place to uh, design, test, innovate and regulate effectively. And we need to uh, continue to build those. So if we could go on to the next um, next slide, please. OK, great. So we've learned a huge amount over the, the last few months uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also know that we're going to have to continue to learn because uh, the challenges are continuing. Continuing, we know that there's a lot of challenges providers are still facing um, with the pandemic and we need to um, continue to respond um, and take those into contacts as we continue our work. Um, and um, during the, I think, very early on, we recognised that actually regulation is um, more important than ever during the period of pandemic. It's more important than ever that we ensure that people get access to safe care and to good quality care. Um, and that purpose was still very much present as we went through uh, the, the early stages and through the last, uh, the last few weeks and months. Um, so. We work in though, we know that providers were under a huge amount of pressure and we work in to support providers to keep people safe um, and allow them to focus on responding to the emergency, avoiding our inspections to uh, spread the virus in inadvertently. We didn't want to be vectors for this virus um, ourselves by our inspectors going in and out of different places and spreading the virus. And we wanted to make sure that we reduced demand for scarce um, PPE. Um, so in view of all of that, we decided to pause um, routine inspections and that happened back in March. 
However, we continue to regulate during that period of time and we continue to inspect based on, on risk and concerns that we saw. We work to engage with providers on a regular basis, see what we could do to support. We continued our monitoring activity um, and we uh, continued our ongoing assessment of safety and quality and worked with many of our partners across the system to be able to do that. Sorry, I'm having problems with my mouse this afternoon, which doesn't seem to want to uh, want to work very well and it's in the wrong place. Bear with me. So we have um, we have gathered a lot of information during this period of time. Um, we've responded to information from people working in um, services, from carers, from people who use services, and um, we've we've responded to safeguarding alerts, to whistleblowing alerts. Um, and we've also uh, had a lot of information from people who use services and their families, um, which has been supported by a national campaign to increase the level of feedback we gather about the quality of care through um, Give Feedback on Care. We've worked very closely with system partners um, and this has helped to support um, informed decision making and we've responded to issues both at a local, regional and national level. And we've introduced something called the Emergency Support Framework, and this has been a tool that we've been using to, to help those structured conversations with uh, providers um, to really look at how we can understand what's happening within a provider and support the care and help that they, um, and they need to be able to deliver good care. We have um, where we've seen um, areas of risk or concern. We've undertaken focused responsive inspections and uh, we have used our powers during this period of time to act against those responsible where we found unsafe or poor care. We've also um, captured and shared all of our findings to uh, make sure that we're transparent as as um, as much as we can be about what action we've taken, um, really also sharing information so that we can uh, inform action taken by our system partners, by government, um, and but also to contribute to future recovery and system-wide learning. Um, we are really keen that we continue to review regulatory risk um, and then um, make sure that we inspect as an appropriate. So, um, so we have developed the new tool, the um, ESF, and um, that's been very well received by the providers that we've talked to who've, who we've been through that, uh, uh, that process with. It is a monitoring tool and it does um, also help us capture some of the innovations. We know that there's been some fantastic innovations over the last um, few weeks and months um, and that uh, providers have worked uh, both individually as providers but across uh, different providers providers to really deliver good care to, to people. So um, can I just take this moment to say thank you to you all because I think what uh, what the systems have done has been really outstanding and um, uh, really great in terms of uh, making sure that uh, those challenges are met. Um, we have uh, sharing learning is really important for us. It's really important in a, a mechanism of driving that improvement that we are able to share the really good stuff that's been happening across um, providers. And we've started to publish a series of insight documents um, related to COVID-19 pressures um, on the sectors that CQC regulates. Uh, this draws on information we've had from our reg regulatory activity, direct feedback from staff um, and people receiving care, and also our regular data collection from services who provide care for people in their own homes. Um, it's also drawn on insight from our, our regular conversations with providers and partners. And this, this information is being used to understand the wider impact of COVID-19, um, to share impacts and regular updates with local, regional and national system partners and the Department of Health and Social Care, and really to highlight any emerging trends and issues which will help to inform the country's response to COVID-19. Um, COVID so if we could go to the next slide. Um, here. So um, so this is is something 
we've really uh, learned over the last few months is that actually information um, information sharing is so important. It's important that uh, people uh, do share information to improve care. It's important that actually the voice of people using services uh, is really heard. Um, and uh, going back to some of the innovations that we've heard, some of them actually are really welcomed by people using services. Um, so for example, digital technologies, uh, there's some been great, uh, great examples where it's improved access and uh, where people have heard, um, have, have had their experience really enhanced. We've heard some people say though actually they find it more difficult to access and so to really shape those developments the voice of people is so important. Um, it's been really important to hear from, from care providers about the challenges they're facing so we can understand the context in which they're working. Um, we also um, know that over the last few months um, local systems have a massive impact um, so we've heard some brilliant stories about where local systems have worked together to, um, to provide care to really understand what the needs of their local populations are. Um, we've heard some stories where that hasn't worked so well and we're really keen to, uh, to learn and um, help systems develop. Um, Transparency is so important and we are absolutely calling uh, for transparency. Um, so it's um, it's really important that people share data, people share information in a way that actually helps the whole system improve. Um, it's important that you know we don't we don't blame each other. We use data for for really improving things, and we can only do that if that is shared widely and um, really shared uh, so everyone can see it and learn from it. Um, so if we can go on to the next slide. And I just want to talk about how we will change. Um, so we have developed four emerging themes for our strategy um, to look at how we kind of take the next uh, the next stage of our development as a regulator forward. And these are meeting people's needs, smarter regulation, promoting safe care for people and driving and supporting improvement. And what we're also doing in parallel to that is to de developing and testing um, an operating model to make sure that we're able to deliver our strategy as we develop. So um, we've talked a bit about how we've actually changed and developed over the last few months, but I think we've still got work to do. We need to really look at how we make our strategy a reality. And we need to do that by building uh, foundations. And this is about actually how do we use our data in really new and dynamic ways? How do we get a dynamic view of the view of quality of care? And how do we use new technology to do that? Adapting and evolving looks at uh, drawing on the foundations we have to adapt and evolve the things that we do to continuously improve. We want to provide us to have an improvement culture that enables them to continuously improve. And we think actually for us as an organisation, we need to be doing the same. We need to be leading the way in developing that improvement culture and really enabling us to keep pace with all of the changes that are happening. And in terms of creating our future, um, this area of work will use our foundations um, as well as building on what we learn um, as we adapt and evolve to create our future, really transforming how we work uh, to make our strategy a reality. This all requires um, lots of engagement and we want to hear your views and hear your voices. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing some of your questions in a minute um, about how we do that. So moving on to the next slide, please, Steph. Um, the the timeline in which we're doing this, we're we're looking at doing this uh, rapidly. So uh, we're looking at uh, the development. We're in phase one at the moment. We're scoping and planning. Um, we sorry, we're not in phase one at all. We're, that was last summer. Bear with me. We're in phase three. Um, we we've done the scoping and planning. We're looking at developing. Uh, we've developed draft priorities. We've developed a people plan, we've rolled out the emergency support framework and uh, we're rolling out the transitional approach as we go into autumn 2020. Um, 
we're testing out future strategic options um, and starting to think about how we really develop this. We will be going out to formal consultation in winter of this year, and then we'll be looking to publish our strategy and implementation in May um, 2021. So particularly for, um, if we could go on to the next slide, please, Steph. Um, particularly for this, um, this area, we think, um, we think that care is better when it's developed through the eyes of people who use services and uh, delivered in partnership uh, with them. And we think that it's the same with regulation. We want to make sure that we understand, report on and act uh, on what matters to people when they access experience and make decisions on their care. Um, we will have a focus on this uh, for those who are seldom heard, those who experience inequalities and those uh, who are vulnerable. And um, we've listed up here how we will do this. We want to uh, regulate services through the eyes of people who use them, um, focusing things on people, uh, focusing on the things that matter to people as they use services. Um, we want to provide information that people need um, when they need it so that they can make individual decisions about their care and that of them close to them. Um, we want to transform how we collect and understand people's in individual experiences and those of local communities, um, particularly people from seldom heard groups, um, those made vulnerable by their circumstances and those at risk of abuse. We think public transparency is very important about what we're hearing from people and how we've acted upon it. Um, we want to be bold about speaking out about poor care. Poor care is unacceptable. Um, we want great care for people. We want good quality care that's safe for people. And we, we will speak out about poor care and inequalities that we see in health and care provision, both at provider level and at system level. We want to empower people to take, uh, um, to improve their own care. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that people have a clear understanding of the standards that they can uh, expect and that will help to empower them in that. Uh, we want to take more active role in identifying variations in quality and availability of care in an area and actually how well is that system responding to the local needs and we want to become a world leader in co-production and co-design. So if we could just move on uh, to the next slide and this is where it would be really helpful to hear your thoughts. We've got some time to have some questions and comments now and some time at the end as well. So what we'd like to hear from you is actually what what do you think CQC's role should be in me meeting people's needs? Should we be looking at systems? How do we really look at uh, regulating services through the eyes of those people um, using services? And um, what role can we play? Addressing inequalities is hugely important for us. How, how do we as a regulator um, take our part in that and make sure that uh, all the people we work with have that focus. Um, so um, I'm looking forward now to, to hearing your questions. Um, so Steph, is that something you'd like to, to, to share some questions at the moment? Yeah, so it's yes, me. So it's it's uh, Jen here. So I'm oh, gonna... sorry, Jen. That's all right. Don't worry. And um, just to say to everybody on on the call uh, today, we will be sharing the slides. And um, so don't worry about that after the webinar today. You'll get a copy of the slides. And also, we've had a few questions through around PPE and other issues about the new visiting guidance that's just been released today. Um, and we will get back to those queries that are outside of the strategy um, after the series is over. So don't worry about that. We've captured all of your information. Um, um, OK, so the first questions were around the, the phrase world class regulator, Rosie. Um, so um, the first question around that is, do we not want world class services rather than just regulation? Um, so the simple answer to that is absolutely yes. And um, I think we'd all want um, health and care services to be world class, um, both in terms of the individual providers, but how they work together. And um, I certainly want world class uh, care for myself and my loved ones. Um, and I'm sure everyone else would feel the same. Um, so I think 
in terms of we've discussed world class on several occasions and wondered if that's the, the, the right ambition or not. And actually we've come to the point where we think it is the ambition that we want to have. We want to be leading the way across the world in looking at actually how as a regulator we can really support um, world class services and to develop um, what can we do as a regulator that's going to stimulate um, providers to think actually you know we want to look for the to be the very best and what we do can actually help support providers to get there and support systems to get there. So um, I, I think we would all want that uh, for the, the people we serve is to make sure that we have um, really, really world class um, health and care services. Just to mention, we do work with regulators from across the world. We do share the way we work. We, we share learning. Um, we share best practice. In the same way, we'd be encouraging pro providers to do um, across uh, across their sectors, um, so that we can look at how we do adopt the the best um, ways of working and the most effective regulation. That's great. Thanks, Rosie. The, there was another question there around the definition of world class regulator, but I think you've touched on that in that answer. But what evidence would that be based on? What evidence about a world class regulator? So I think I think um, that's a good, very good question. Um, I think we would be basing ourselves on um, a whole range of intelligence about what we do. So firstly, are we confident that we've got evidence that we are uh, supporting providers to uh, improve and uh, become the best that they can be? Um, have we got evidence from the public that they are clear um, about what we do? why we do it. It does really genuinely help them choose uh, which services to use. Um, have we got other countries coming to us asking us what we're doing? Um, and we do, at the moment, we do have other countries coming and, and interested in what we do. Um, and, uh, and have we got the confidence of uh, providers, the public, stakeholders um, in what we do uh, to make sure that um, they can, everyone can be confident that we are really delivering on our purpose. So I think there wouldn't be one form of evidence. I think as we do with all of our kind of current work, we'd look at a whole range of, of uh, different metrics that would help us come to that, um, uh, come to that position. And as I said earlier, I think, you know, it's not a static thing. I think um, someone said the other day, which I think is a lovely phrase, if, if you're not, if you're not improving, you're actually getting going backwards. And I think um, we need to have that improvement culture, which we do within the organisation. So we learn, we continually evolve, we continually, continually adapt to what we do so that we get better and better. That's great. There's a, a lot of discussion um, happening around systems in the chat. Um, so there's a comment here. I agree with Rosie that quality of care is an emergent outcome of a network of providers and interactions. If this is the case, surely inspecting and rating individual providers must be invalid. So that's, so that's look and how we're going to be um, addressing that in our in our strategy. Yes. So that's a really, really good question and something that's uh, very close to what I'm passionate about. I am. I, I believe that um, you, to get good quality care, you need really good quality care within a provider, but you also need really good quality um, collaboration and system wide working between providers as well. And um, we it's something we are talking about uh, at the moment is actually how do we start to look at uh, systems and how they work because we all know there's in huge Im impact if um, for example a transfer of medicines from if you get discharged from hospital into a care home and there's a, a problem with the transfer of medication um, information or if um, if the care home's not getting the support it needs from the, the providers around it or you know if the pathways between primary and secondary care we've seen a lot of that over the last few weeks we've seen some great examples of where it's worked well we've seen some examples where it hasn't worked very well and actually people have come to harm and that's not um, not something that's acceptable at all and um, what we're doing is and, and we've got another discussion about this actually tomorrow in a similar webinar is we're currently rolling out a system, uh, a, a series of what we're calling provider collaboration reviews, which are really starting to catch 
capture the learning that's happened over COVID and starting to look at how can we share that best practice with how providers have worked together um, to look at um, collabor collaboration to improve people's care and how do we share that learning quite quickly before any potential second wave or any um, or, or before winter. That's that methodology is based on some of the learning we had from the local system reviews a couple of years ago, and some of you may have seen the uh, publication around that. It was called Beyond Barriers, and it, it kind of gave a, a flavour of what we think uh, systems need to be considering to really uh, drive that good quality care in their systems. It is something we want to progress. Where we have that spectrum between what we can do um, at a system level and what we can do at a provider level, that's what we need to work through over the coming few months. And we need to really understand how do we understand the quality of care within a provider by looking at a system. And can we um, can we shift that to, to more of a system view than a provider view? I think the general consensus at the moment is we probably need to do both um, and we probably need to um, need to look at both care within a provider and care with us within a system but is there an opportunity i think within our system work to start to think actually how do we use that to really identify the the kind of concerning providers um in a way that um, enables us to to make sure our regulation is right touch across the board that's great so um, some more questions around systems. There's lots of uh, discussion around uh, funding and commissioning. Um, so a few of the comments, local uh, authority assessments of funding and commissioning practice need to be brought back to the regulator. World class services need world class funding. Inequalities in local areas, funding care, um, the variation in contracts with independent providers is shocking. That is the greatest inequality for our vulnerable people. Um, so one of the questions here is, that our purpose and vision is is great, but how can it be done fairly in an inequitable health and social care system with different budgets and populations? Yes, really good question, and I think it's it's certainly something that um, we will be kind of exploring through the work we're doing around systems. Um, at the moment, we don't we don't have the legal powers to look at commissioning. Um, our legal powers very much look at how providers work. I think that's something we, we need to um, explore as we go forward, but it's it's certainly something at the moment we can only look at providers and uh, we can only look at how providers work together and we're not able to comment on the commissioning structures around them. I think what is important is that, um, you know, we, we look at how um, providers both individually and as a system are really thinking about what their population needs are, how they're really looking to meet those population needs. And uh, I think we've got an opportunity through the work we do with our independent voice to, to share that and to, I guess, also talk about the themes that might not be going um, as well and what we hear from providers in our things like our state of care report. Um, my personal viewpoint, I was a commissioner for a very long time, um, and this is a personal viewpoint, but not a CQC viewpoint, but my personal viewpoint is that actually if you get um, if you get quality right first time round, very often it's more cost effective than if you um, if you have lots of failure demand across the system. Now that does require systems uh, to work together, providers to work together across the system and to have all sorts of uh, arrangements in place that will enable uh, you know resources to be shared and and used and that collaboration is really important but you know there's numerous examples of where failure demand um, because people aren't getting the quality of care they need first time round increases cost in systems and whether that's things like um, people ending up in the wrong place um, and in crisis care because there's not the early intervention people um, uh, not getting the end of life, uh, not um, having advanced care planning discussions uh, and thinking about where they actually want to spend the end of their life and then ending up in the wrong place. Um, cancer not being diagnosed early enough and needing much more treatment uh, further down the line. So I think I think we do need to think about how do we um, move move pathways and how do we how do we look at kind of people's needs right from early on in pathways and um 
early on in a person's journey so that actually they get better quality care but actually from the system resource use and everything else it's it's more effective that's great thank you and there's lots of reflections here on the needs of people and um, so there's a comment here that our inspection reports need to be more user friendly more service user friendly and also will cqc be including contingencies for loneliness and isolation in future frameworks i think that one of that's one of the biggest takeaways from the crisis mm. Again, really good questions and comments. Um, I think we do need to look at our inspection reports. Um, we need to think about who they're for. We need to think about actually how do we get the information in a um, much easier to understand way to people who are using those uh, reports. Um, so I think that's something we will be looking at. Um, and actually, how do we get much more real time information to people using services as well? So at the moment we go in and inspect and then we go in and inspect a, you know, however long afterwards. And that's a snapshot in in terms of those reports and that that person's understanding of the service. And I think we need to think about um, more real-time information to people using the services so they can make really informed decisions um, as they go forward. Um, Jen, I've forgotten the second part of the question, sorry, and it was an important one. Oh, fair, yes, it was about older people, wasn't it, and loneliness, sorry. Yes, I just loneliness, remember. yeah. Yeah, so absolutely, I think that um, uh, this has been a, a key issue for you know forever but i think it's it's absolutely over the last few months is something that uh, has become really um apparent um and really something that we need to tackle and i think there's a variety of ways we could look at um what we do to tackle that so i think when we look at providers and how they meet population needs um how they meet the needs of their population we see in some of our outstanding work uh, the outstanding practices uh, that certainly in in general practice that i'm most familiar with we see some brilliant work where providers have actually really understood that they're they, they've got a, a population where there's significant um, loneliness or significant um, uh, people who, who can't access services or, or whatever the population needs are. And we've seen the providers take some really proactive action to be able to, to support that. And sometimes there's things like uh, social prescribing models or, or different ways that providers are organising themselves. Um, I think one of the things that's come out from COVID is the brilliant work that the volunteers have done um, you know actually how do we harness some of that um, because I think there's been some tremendous stories about how volunteers have worked um, with providers to look at um, supporting people who are on their own or um, supporting people with, with certain needs so how do we how do we harness that how do we really kind of accelerate that now I think is a question for all of us um, uh, to make sure that those gains um, continue that's great. Am I all right to do just one more, Steph, before we go on? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of discussion around um, how we're engaging with people using services, Rosie. So in terms of regulating, are CQC looking to change the way they complete their inspections to include greater engagement with people using services, meeting with people and listening to their views? Absolutely. So um, it's something that's already very important to us and we already um, do what we can to to listen to people who use services. Um, we, we spend time um, both locally, um, regionally and nationally uh, working with people who use uh, services and their representative groups. I think it's something that we absolutely want to um, uh, want to uh, accelerate. And actually, if I could just um, uh, put up the next slide because I think that's that says it all actually um, so if we could move to the next slide because we do want to put the public at the heart of everything we do um, it's so important that um, we hear people's experiences and we hear everyone's experiences of care um, we we want to encourage people to feedback on the care feedback care that's good, feedback care that's not so good um, and their experiences because actually that's how we get the rich information about uh, what uh, what care is available. Um, we can we want to hear from providers as well but um, actually sometimes you get a very different flavour of what's happening by listening to people's experiences of, of using care. Um, 
And actually what we find is the, the outstanding providers often are very much doing this naturally. They, they're working with their local populations. They're working with the people that use services. Um, they're listening. They're continually improving based on the, the, the feedback that they're getting. Um, and we want to want to encourage that, but also encourage people to talk to us so we can use that information um, as well. And if we could um, I think I don't think we've got a slide here, but we're just um, just about to launch uh, a campaign because we all care um, with Healthwatch to look at how we can really um, capture more and more people's experience of care. I think um, just to add to that, I think there is something about capturing people's experience of care in um, in actually us regulating the individual provider. I think there's something about us capturing experiences of care as people move through the system. I think there's us kind of challenging providers and systems as to how they're working with people who use their services to improve care. Um, and I think there's something about policy as well in terms of how do we make sure policymakers um, uh, in all, all sectors actually really um, co-produce what they do with people who use, uh, who use services. Um, so if we could just move, um, move on to the next slide. Um, so this is just uh, to say, let's just move my slides down here. Just bear with me a moment. So um, this is ways um, and to get involved and to stay up to date with what we're doing. We we do want to hear from all of you. We want the, the more we can um, hear about the, the your thoughts about the themes um, that we've got, the, the more that we can hear about your thoughts about what we're doing, the more we can use that to um, improve what we do. Um, so please do get involved in our citizen lab um, and the address is on the slide here, which um, as Jen mentioned earlier, we will be sharing. Um, we are uh, continuing to send out our provider bulletins. Um, we used to give them, uh, we used to send them out monthly. Um, during COVID, we've been sending them out weekly. We've now changed that to twice a month and there's always um, lots of information in those. And we do um, scan all of our social media, so that uh, scan the Twitter account. So please do feedback from that point of view as well. Um, so do get involved. Really, really important for us that we hear from everyone. And just onto the last, um, last slide. Um, and uh, that's all of the information um, I was going to say, but I, I think we've got a few more minutes, so I'm very happy to, to have more questions or comments. Yeah, um, so we've got um, a few uh, comments around supporting innovation and not just supporting it, but also the governance side of it as well, Rosie. So um, will CQC recognise the innovation providers have made during COVID-19 when inspections start again? identifying outstanding areas of innovation yes I, I mean I think I think it's um I think we're very aware that uh, providers have gone to enormous lengths um, to change what they do and there's been some brilliant innovation um, across all of the different sectors that we regulate um, and we we want to um, so in the short term we will absolutely be looking for those examples. Uh, we have got a mechanism I think that you can feed through um, innovations through to us so we can share them. And um, Jen, I think if you are able to share that information, that would be helpful. Um, we also have um, we, we're keen through the provider collaboration reviews to capture that in innovation and to be able to share that widely um, and to um, to really kind of shine a spotlight on all of the brilliant things that have been happening. Longer term, I think one of the recognitions that we've got is that um, we want to really enable innovation. Uh, you know, the health and care services need to innovate to be able to manage all of the demands that we know uh, face them. And um, I've heard on several occasions, well, um, people say, well, the CQC won't let us do that or, you know, that's not allowed and all sorts of things. And absolutely, we do not want to be any kind of barrier to innovation. We want to really um, support it. We want to enable it. Um, what, we, we, what we do need to make sure is that those innovations 
uh, properly thought through in terms of governance and accountability and also properly thought through in terms of any kind of safety risks and um, impact of, of quality of care and um, you know so so we do need to make sure that um, that, that services are, are absolutely good quality and, and safe, but we don't want to be any kind of barrier. And if anyone ever hears that uh, people say, oh, well, the CQC won't let us do that or, or anything similar, let us know, get in touch with us, get in touch with your local inspectors or, or through the other channels um, that are up here, because we need to understand that and we need to, to work on it uh, and um, make sure our processes and systems really enable that innovation to happen. That's great. Thanks, Rosie. And um, so the other side of the questions were around that that governance um, question. Um, so will CQC highlight the need for evaluation of video consultations? And there's also one here. Would the CQC be updating the scope of practice to provide more clarity around online GP consultations and the use of digital technologies? Yes. That's um, that's a, again good questions, and we know general practice um, in particular, but several other sectors have gone through this huge transformation in terms of using online technology. We know there was some great work going on before, actually, and we've worked closely uh, over the last couple of years with online providers um, and have a really good understanding about um, what good looks like and uh, have published uh, reports around that. And we've also uh, published a report in January, which is around uh, the use of digital triage and how we do that safely. Um, I think what we've got to work on now over the next, uh, the next few weeks um, and months um, is, and, and we've been having discussions with lots of our partners around this, is actually how do we make sure that services really do meet the needs of their population? We know from talking to people that actually the online provision has been fantastic in so many ways. It's it's um, accelerated access. Um, it's enabled kind of routine care to be done in a way that's um, that doesn't require people to come out of their own homes, particularly if they're shielding or, or more vulnerable. We know, however, that there's um, there's some people who just find it really difficult to access um, digital services and online services, and we need to understand that, and we need to understand how a um, providers making sure that they um, enable a service that meets people's needs and that doesn't become a barrier to anyone accessing those services. Um, and that's what we'd certainly be looking for over the next uh, few weeks and months. I believe there's been some great work um, done recently uh, from the NHS England have been involved in um, looking at safe online um, consulting and um, and work around that. Um, and I think we need to build on that um, and understand, are we missing anything? I think some of the conversations I've had with various um, GP bodies is actually, uh, are, we, are we confident that we're, we're capturing everything, that we can deal with all of the things we're dealing with online or what are we missing um, and how do we make sure that um, we're not missing kind of important things that are going to uh, lead to harm to people. So um, great work across um, all of the sectors around online. I think there's quite a lot we've got to do to understand it and evolve as we go forward. That's great. Thanks, Rosie. There's um, a lot of comments with, with likes around consistency of our inspections. So how will you ensure regulation is consistent with this new strategy? Yeah, a very good question and something that's really important to us because I think there's um, there's there's consistency both within these the sectors and consistency across all of the different sectors that we regulate and over the last few years we've done a lot of work to see how we can get our, our consistency better um, with quality assurance mechanisms and various other things that we've put in place um, within the sectors um, it's, it's there's more to do um, but certainly I think the opportunities that we've got now to work across all of the sectors to look at consistency are, um, are significant. And I certainly working very closely with my uh, chief inspector colleagues in adult social care and hospitals um, 
Ted and, and Kate to look at actually how do we how do we start to drive that? I think the opportunities involved around us firstly having better technology and better systems um, that enable us to uh, to drive that consistency in the way that we're working. Um, I think there's something about how we use data. We're really keen to make sure that we we do use data um, in a way that actually helps us form those judgments in a very consistent manner. Um, and I think that. Uh, uh, also, how we continue to work with our, our teams to look at training and development um, and um, and skill development is something important as well. So it's, it's something that's very, um, very high on our agenda. Um, we want to make sure that what we do is consistent so that the public can understand um, our judgments and understand um, how we've got to them and that providers have the confidence that our, our processes are robust. That's great, thank you. I've got some queries around um, the use of data and intelligence. So we've got one here. Can the CQC review and accept practice held data during inspections as this is verifi ver verifiable and up to date? Sorry, I didn't. Um, GP didn't, practice. Sorry, in GP practices, just can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Can the CQC review and accept practice held data during inspections? Um, up to date. Yes, so the answer to that is yes, it depends a bit on the type of data and there's all sorts of uh, kind of nuances and, and complications around different data sources like around vaccinations and things which I won't go into um, here. But essentially what we're looking for is for a provider to be able to um, give us evidence. Uh, so, you know, we want to hear what a provider is doing and actually how they can evidence what they're doing as well. And some of the best practices that we see are practices that um, actually, you know, the, the, some of the outstanding practices that we work with are brilliant because they don't just audit something once, they're really interested, they, they've got that kind of spirit of inquiry that makes them think actually, what am I doing with patients who've got these needs or, you know, how am I really looking at my uh, High, um, high risk medications or you know that whatever question it is and they they go away and they they audit it and then they don't just do another audit cycle they keep auditing it it um it until they're actually confident that they've got a kind of sustainable position and then they keep following it up and um they they they've got that kind of improvement understanding that shows that they know how to use um data to really improve things um and that in itself evidences that kind of culture that the provider has got that they they're using data themselves they um uh, they they they're really looking at improving the care for their the people that use their services. So we will look at we will look at any data that a provider gives us, um, and I think it's important um, if 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 people can kind of evidence what they're doing. We absolutely want to see that. Thank you. There's also another question here around PIC. Will there be any developments to PIC? Is there an update on that? So that's part of the work we're doing with the um, the regulatory transition work. And um, at the moment, it's too early for us to to be in a position um, to to say where that's going because we're still working through what does our our new methodology look like as we get to the autumn and beyond. Um, how do we pull on all of the things that have worked well from our previous methodology and our previous inspections? And how do we take the best of those and move it forward? Um, I think what we do want to do is make sure that we um, we use all mechanisms possible to be able to use data in a way that um, gets us the data that's going to give us the information about how well a provider is doing, um, but also make sure that we're working with other regulators so that we don't, uh, you don't have several regulators all asking for the same thing in a different way, um, which we, we are aware causes um, an increased workload for practices and increased workload for providers. So um, regarding PIC, I think it's going to be a case of watch this space. Um, we, we're working on it at the moment and as soon as we've worked through what that looks like in terms of our, our methodology, we will be out and communicating that. That's great. You talked there about working um, together with other regulators. Are we going to be working with other agencies such such as Ofsted um, as uh, the care market's changing? That's another question there. Yeah, certainly. So we uh, we work closely with Ofsted at the moment, actually. I've, I've got um, 
uh, a team in my directorate that works with Ofsted looking at um, provision for people with special educational needs um, and disabilities and um, and so we've got a really good working relationship with Ofsted and um, and and that's kind of continuing to have discussions about how we evolve and adapt to what we do. And we work, we have conversations with many uh, different regulators because as well as um, looking at what the opportunities for us to work together in a certain area to improve the care um, in, in areas so that uh, we can we can have a focused approach. We also share information about what we're doing, how we're doing it, how we can learn from each other and how we can um, uh, we can continue to to improve as as regulators together. So um, so absolutely. That's great. We've got time for one more, Steph. Yeah, I think we can squeeze one more in. Okay, so this um, one's got quite a few likes. Are there going to be through this strategy? Are there going to be any changes to the actual regulations? Um, that's uh, that's a good question. I think that's something we are working through at the moment. I think it's. Um, uh, there are things in our regulations that we need to explore and and change as needed. So, for example, we've talked about system working. Um, we at the moment, our regulations only allow us to uh, look at providers. Um, there is a question, should we be looking at systems uh, and being able to comment on commissioning, for example? Um, so that's something we need to explore. We need to think about what's in scope of regulation and what's not in scope of regulation. So, for example, in the independent um, sector in some of the things that are provided in the independent sector uh, for example around cosmetics um, some of them some of them fit within our regulations some of them don't whereas we know some of these uh, things that are out of scope of our regulation sometimes lead to harm to people and um, and we need to uh, look at how we can make sure our regulations are fit for purpose so that they actually enable us to keep ahead of what's coming um, in terms of the changes in the health and care landscape. That's great. Thanks, Rosie. Should we take one more, Steph, or should we close there? I think it might be safe to close there. Yeah, OK. Well, can I can I just say thank you to everyone who's joined? Really, really appreciated. Um, I'm looking forward to reading through all of the, the comments and questions after this. Um, and we will definitely um, be back in touch uh, with those questions we haven't been able to answer. So so thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a great afternoon.